stood around him and laughed, but not from joy. Then they did a terrible thing. They threw vegetables and stones at Giovanni so that he had to run for his life. Beside the stream, Giovanni took off his clown face. He put away his sticks and plates, his clubs and rings and colored balls. He put away his costume, and he gave up juggling forever. What little money he had was soon gone, and his clothes became rags, and he baked his bread and slept in doorways as he had done as a child. It's time to go home. The old man said wearily, and headed back to Sorrento. It was a cold winter night when he finally arrived. The wind blew hard, and an icy rain was falling. Up ahead loomed the monastery church of the little brothers. The windows were in darkness. Wet and cold, the old Giovanni crept inside and fell in the heap in the corner. Soon asleep. It was the music that woke him up. The church was blazing with candlelight and filled with the people singing, Gloria, Gloria. Giovanni could scarcely believe it. seemed so stern, so serious. Oh, lady, said Giovanni, I wish I had something to offer you. Your child seems so sad, even with all these beautiful gifts. But wait, I used to make people smile. Giovanni opened his back. Just be careful if you move, because then I can hear every time. Oh, okay. Okay, then you tell me when you want me to start telling the story of... Do I say, hi, I'm Bud Freeman? <laughs> sure. About 18 years ago, a little better than 18 years ago, I responded to a council of churches had about needing a, can you back up and start again? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start again. I can go. After I push the button, I have to wait while it gets five ready seconds. again. Because when it starts, there's colors that are going through your body. Uh, in about five seconds. Well, that's what that felt. I wondered what those colors were. I'm seeing rainbows. <laughs> Careful when looking up, too. Yeah, my glasses, glasses, too. Glasses. Mm -hmm. Over 18 years ago, I answered an ad in the old Oregon Council of Churches newsletter for someone who wanted to do spots for a rock station. Well, I listened to some of those, those preachers, and they sound like they're getting a three-point sermon in in one minute, so I said, sure, I'd like to do it. Having teenage daughter, Margaret, who was around 15 at the time, we decided we'd use some of the music from Simon and Garfunkel and the Beatles, and we put together 15 spots that used to play on a station called KK, no, KISN, Kissin Radio. And they ran for three years. They felt they were that good. After that, I became a part of the Council of Churches Interfaith Broadcasting Commission, and one of the men on, the, on that commission had been doing a program for five years called Open Door. I'm going to, can I just stop you? Sure. Eighteen years ago, 
something like this was my main source of, of use, the Jerusalem Bible, a place of inspiration. It still is. Oh, I wasn't quite that far enough, so go ahead and just... Do it again? Yeah. Okay. About 18 years ago, this was my daily accompaniment, my source of inspiration. It still is and has been through the years, but I've added another source of inspiration, at least of insight, and it's called Billboard Magazine. And the reason it all goes together is that 18 years ago I got bit by radio. I responded to an ad in the local Portland Council of Churches newsletter to do one-minute spots, and together with my 15-year-old daughter, we produced some 15 of them, which were aired on the old station called KISN, 90 Wonderful in Portland. It was one of the top rock stations. I wasn't a connoisseur of rock music. I have become one who's listened to a great deal of it through the years. But with my daughter, we put together these 15 spots using Beatles, Simon Garfunkel, people of that age and genre, and produced one-minute spots that played for three years. In the process, I also became a part of the Interfaith Broadcasting Commission. And there was a man on that board who had been doing a talk show on KGW called Open Door. It was a half-hour interview program. And so he asked, you know, I've been doing it five years. Would you like to take over? I thought, why not? I was serving a local parish, Kenilworth Presbyterian Church in southeast Portland. And I thought, sure, why not? And uh, about six months after we began, the program director asked if I'd like to change the format because KGW was working into the rock format, and we said, okay, let's give it a try. And Hal Widston, who was the PD at the time, had another program going on that utilized the rock music and mixed in oh, social commentary of the day. Remember, this is in the early stages of the Vietnam War and unrest among students. So we decided that would be a good format, and I gathered around me some eight to ten young people from the church I was serving, and they began writing bits and pieces for the program and telling me what music to listen to. That's where Billboard came into being. And I would open up to the middle of the pages, and they had a, a, a sheet at that time that you could open up, and it would have all the latest hits. It still does, but they don't have a centerfold anymore, and I can't thrill some of my people, but it does tell me here's a hundred top singles that are, are current on the charts. And I would look over those, I became familiar with them, and then I also helped the young people get their ideas down. I felt very deeply, and still do, that I'm not the only person with all the truth. And so what began was a process that developed what Open Door is today. It utilizes, instead of the writings from well-known authors from around the world making their commentary on various themes, it's the people themselves, my audience, who begin sending in their prose, their writings, their observations. My belief is that truth is truth no matter where you find it. If it's truthful, if it's right, it's of God. So it could be a person on death row on in, in a prison who may have an insight that will strike to the very heart of all of us. It could be a serviceman serving in a very lonely place in the Aleutians who sends in a piece of prose that speaks about loneliness. Could be a young girl who, after hearing one of our programs on a sense of love, wrote and said, I felt that life just wasn't worth living, and I was about to take my own life when your program on love came on. And I thought, well, somebody out there cares about me. Maybe I can care about me as well. And she became one of those who sent us a lot of prose, and it was very fitting. Well, it's the genius of the individual, the creativity of the individuals around the world, literally, who have sent their insights and understandings and my job and my fun has been to take them from these different sources, put them all together, listen to lots and lots of music, and say, okay, here's a theme. It might be on purpose, a theme on called purpose, 
and we deliberately and intentionally build a theme with music and writings that are fitting to that. We go into the studio, and this group of eight or nine young people will come in, and not having seen the script before we get there, will be given the prose, given their script, and will on the spot read the prose. We may go over it four and five, six times to get what we want, but we will lay the tracks down. In that way, we have not only the, the writings from the age group, but secondly, we have somebody from the same age group reading it and interpreting it. So through the years, this is what we've done. And the response of listeners from all parts of the world has been uh, extremely meaningful to me. I feel privileged to have walked in a field and been welcomed into the world of, first of all, teens and now young adults, an age that I'm definitely far beyond, and to walk in that world and listen to their observations and gain insight for my own living from what they had to say. Listening to the music has given me more insights as well as far as so many people saying from within the church that rock music, you know, is of the devil. Well, there's lots of music that's of the devil, and some of it is rock. But there are other artists out there who are struggling to, to say something significant. So I find the, the delight in going through and finding somebody like Rick Springfield talking about tear it all down, which means there's a lot of stuff that we, as my generation, have produced that have created problems and walls and barriers to getting to know other people, and he says, tear it all down. Well, I couldn't agree more. It may not be the way in which I would like to say it or do it, but here is one sensitive person who is saying, come on now, let's do something about it. So over the years, these are the kinds of themes that have been developed. As you listen to music, on the one hand, as I listen to the writings and look and read the writings of others, and then putting them together as one piece, and it becomes literally an open door through which our listeners can come and can share their writings, their insights, their observations, which ultimately, I feel, are their gift given to them by God. And the word that we often use is charisma. Uh, the charisma means gifts in Greek and it's the gifts of the Spirit that God has given to these listeners who may or may not have any conviction or commitment to Jesus Christ, but who have an awareness that they have a sense of truth, a sense of understanding. And sometimes when they write, they aren't. They're just writing out of frustration and fear, but many times out of the desire to make this a more loving world the way God has meant it to be. So open door is an open door for them to come in through and also for their ideas to flow out because it's a two-way door. Been fortunate through the years to have had people who believed in this ministry. The Presbytery of the Cascades has been very helpful in supporting it. My denomination is providing some of the duplication of the program to the 75 or more stations in the United States, the heiress, the armed forces, heiress on some of their 400 stations around the world, and then Quito, Ecuador, HCJB, shortwave station on their English channel, sends us three times around the world, once to the South Pacific, once to the Americas, and once to West Africa and Europe. And so we get letters from behind the Iron Curtain, from East Berlin and Germany, in Finland, from Auckland, New Zealand, to uh, Tokyo, Japan, even to India and West Africa. So it's a worldwide ministry, and it surprises me sometimes where we're heard and the responses we receive from people around the world. But that shouldn't surprise me because they too are God's children, wanting a door through which they can share their ideas, offering to others who will likewise come in through that door and gain insight and understanding into their own lives. Perhaps in a small way then, together we share the gift of God's love. Can I have you sit down? The last, that last part one more time and I'm going <laughs> to... I can remember. Perhaps as 
we look at this ministry, what's been going on for 18 years now, we can see that people from Calabar, Nigeria, in West Africa, to Auckland, New Zealand, to Bronxville, New York, to Portland, Oregon, all have something in common, a desire to share love, the kind that the good Lord has given to us to share, the kind that we can have as brothers and sisters of a common God, seeking to love and understand each other and live peaceably one with the other. All I'd like to have you do is, is uh, put your hands out, just like you know, like that, and then, well, okay, okay, and then. Because, uh, because you made a gesture earlier, oh. so that you take the pros. Oh, oh, okay, you want, oh, okay, we take the pros. Oh, oh, not in. 